So, my first talk this morning will be devoted to describing the internal logic of a topos and showing how you can use this internal logic to develop a proof in the topos. So, as Laurent insisted many, many times, uh, a topos is some world which is as good and sometimes better than the world of sets. And everything that uh, we want to do in set, we should be able to do it in the topos. But while it is quite simple in sets to work with just elements in a topos of sheaves, uh, it's a little bit more sophisticated. And the idea of the internal logic is, among other things, one application of the internal logic of a topos is to say, never mind. You work in a Grothendieck topos. You work in an elementary topos. Write down the proof as if you were in the case of sets. If it works, the result is true in the topos. Okay, there are some rules to be respected in order to achieve this purpose. And it is what I would like to explain in this first talk. And in the last talk, I shall switch to well, some more philosophical ideas on uh, what infinite means in a topos. So, the first thing is to describe the language. So, what I shall explain now, do not try to give any meaning to that. We are mathematicians. We are used to write down sentences using symbols. What are the sentences that we are allowed to write down? It is what I call the language of the topos. I am not interested in this first approach to what those sentences can mean, if they are true or they are false. No. What are the sentences that we are allowed to write down? And like for all sentences, you start from very simple things, from the very basic letters which, with which you will build words and sentences. So I am in a topos. Take your favorite topos. Take it locally on the topological space. Take it Grothendieck. Take it an elementary topos. It doesn't matter. So, in my sentences, I shall use some symbols of type A, A, which is an object of the topos. I take one symbol, which I call a constant, for each morphism to A. Imagine, we want to study the field of real numbers. If we want to study the field of real numbers, we want to be able to speak about the square root of 2, about 3 over 4, about pi, about those things. All the real numbers, they are constants of our theory. But, if we want to study real numbers, we need something else than the real numbers. Because I would like to express the fact that A times B plus C is A times B plus A times C. Of course, I could write that formula for all the possible real numbers A, B, C, so uh, it would be a uh, very huge infinite set of formulae. It doesn't make sense to do that. What we are doing, we write this, and we have just letters which are standing there and represent a real number. Which one? Doesn't matter. They represent any possible real numbers. 
they are called the variables. How many variables are there? Well, my goodness, when I write a formula, my formula is finite because my life is finite, so I have no time to write an infinite formula in my life. So I shall take a denumerable set of variables which I shall write A, B, C, and so on, and which I shall use to express things about, about my object A. These are the basic letters of my language. Countable, yes, countable, yes, countable. Well, infinite, we take an infinite, an infinite number. You, because I don't know how many I shall need, so you just take uh, an infinite number. An infinite number of... Eh? Well, it's... If you take one million of them, it will be highly sufficient because you will never write a formula with one million of variables. So you take a number which is bigger than the longest formula you will ever write in your life. Okay? Uh, and now, from that, we shall build more sophisticated things. And we shall build what I shall call terms and formulae. <coughs> what is a term? Well, a term is, for example, e plus pi power this. This represents if A represents, is a variable, about the real numbers, this represents some real number. But when I write A plus B equals B plus A, this is not a real number. This is a property of real numbers. So that will be a term, that will be a formula. And uh, you define the terms and the formula in an inductive way. So, for example, the terms of type A are the constants, certainly they are terms, the variables are terms, and then, and then, if you have a mapping, a morphism in the topos from A to B, and if you have to a term of type a, suppose this term has already been defined uh, before, well, then you decide that the word F, open bracket, to, close the bracket, so it is just a word that you write with symbols, you decide that this is a term of type B. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand this a plus pi whole to the power 3 by 4. So if the number of real numbers must be finite when you are defining something like this. Uh, so Yes. It is there. Okay. So, but if you wait the end of the definition, probably you will also have the answer to your question. So, if I have now a term, tau 1, tau 1 of type A1, uh, let me say tau n of type An, then I construct a word I open the bracket T1, a comma, up to Tn. I say that this is a term 
of type A1 times An. Intuitively, if those things represent elements of the AI, well, this bracket represents an element of the product. And so, if on the product you have an addition, you just apply this and that, and you construct the addition. Well, and there is a last thing, but it involves a formula, so let me first switch to the formula. What are the formula? Well, true is a formula, and false is a formula. I decide that when I say true, that's a formula. When I say false, it's a formula. And, uh, well, if I have sigma and tau, which are terms of type A, I decide that sigma equals tau is a formula. Do not ask me if it is true or false. That's not the point for the time being. I explain how to construct formulae. Uh, if you have a formula sigma, then I decide that not sigma is a formula. The negation of sigma is a formula. If I have formula sigma and tau, I decide that sigma and tau, sigma or tau, sigma implies tau that all those things are formulae. Just formal writings. And in the same way, I shall decide that things like there exists uh, A such that phi of AB is a formula or for every A, phi of AB is a for that those things are formulae. Again, if you have already uh, anterior formula uh, in this formula, uh, you have possibly some variables, because you see in the construction you are using terms, and in the terms you can possibly have used constants and variables, so you can do this kind of things. And here we shall have, I do not write all the details on uh, where the variables should lie, but I should have a formula uh, I should have a term like that. If I have a formula phi about a variable of type A, well, this will be of type omega power A. Why is that the case? Well, I remind you. Can you see this at the back? No. So I shall try to, to write it at a higher place. So what I have written at the very end, the very last formula is that the set of A such that phi of A is a term of type omega A when A of course is of type A. So indeed I remind you that the subobject, that the subobjects of A correspond bijectively with their characteristic mappings. This is the same as 1 times A to omega. This is the same by Cartesian closedness as the morphisms like that. So the constant of type omega A are exactly the subobjects of A. So I want to construct there a subobject of A. So this is the language of my topos. This is what I allow me to write down. And I think you've forgotten the universal quantifier. The universal? Ah, it, it is there. <laughs> yeah. So I have given you some letters, you know, like the, the letter and the letter or, the letter implies, the letter for all, the letter will exist. They, they are just symbols. And I have given some rules how to put those symbols together in order to write an acceptable sentence. Yeah? yeah in what you wrote, uh, except for the omega, the, the other exponentials do not appear. 
No, up, up to now, no, no, no. So, that's the kind of things you are doing in mathematics. But those sentences that you write down should be somehow related to the topos you are working with. You want, using that, to say something about your topos. So, when I say, okay, if I have a, a natural number n, and uh, if I have a rational, uh, yes, uh, if I have a rational number q, I can buy, I can construct the real number uh, r times pi exponentiated at the nth power. This will be a real number. Yeah, this is indeed a term of type r in what I have done if I take well, a variable of type q, a variable of type n, a constant of pi. Okay, then I have something uh, which, which is in n times q times r. Eh? I have a term of that type uh, which is given, so n r pi. And because of the operations I have, multiplication, exponentiation, which are operations which are there, I can construct this term. Okay. I can construct it. But concretely, in the category of sets, this is not just a formal writing. You get, in the category of sets, an actual mapping which maps this on that. From my term, I can construct an actual mapping, which, with such an element, gives me this real number. So this is called the interpretation of the term in the topos. So now I shall interpret all the terms in the topos. Well, a constant is very easy to interpret. It is itself. A constant is by definition a morphism from 1 to A. It is itself. A variable, well, the variable, you interpret the variable as being the identity. The variable A, well, that's the thing which, the, which is the morphism associated to that, well, if you have A, well, you have A, you apply to it. So you interpret the interpretation, the corresponding application. Uh, if you take just the identity function X, well, the identity function X maps, uh, well, is the identity on X, on the set X. Uh, So, if you have a term of type A, which is already interpreted, you have a term which is already interpreted as a morphism with codomain A, suppose this is already done for two, what is the interpretation of F of two? Well, it is just the composite, of course. You take the interpretation of two and you compose with F. This is the interpretation of f of tau. The same thing here. If you have the tau i which go to a i, well, you just take the family of the tau i, tau 1 to tau n, which goes to a n, a 1 product a n, and so on. Oh, the formula, ah, the formula, I shall come back later, I first have to express to you, to explain to you what I am doing with the formula. 
What am I doing with the formulae? Well, when I have a formula like a plus b equals b plus a, what I am interested to know is the formula true or is it false? So I am interested to know for which a and b this formula is true. So when I have a formula which is defined on some variables, let me say a formula phi with a variable a of type a, and there could be, it could be a formula with many variables, of course. And I have a formula, I just take the simple case with a variable a, I would like to know when is it the case that this formula is true. So I would like to say when I have an element A, uh, I would like to send it on true if phi of A is true and false if phi of A is false in set. So, that's my idea. I do not yet know what it means to be true or false for a formula. But that's the idea I have in mind. So the idea is that a formula should be interpreted as a morphism to the truth value object. Omega, in the case of set, it is just true, false. In the case of a local, okay, you have all the levels where mm, this can be true. So we see that we should it, uh, interpret a formula as a morphism to omega, which will tell us when the formula is valid, and then the set of A, such that phi of A, will be the subobject classified by that morphism. Fine. So, I have, it remains to explain how I interpret the formulae in the topos. And so a formula should be interpreted as a morphism to omega. Well, true, you know it. We have the subobject classifier, true. False, well, false is just uh, You take the inclusion of the zero object in one, you take its characteristic mapping to omega, and this is the interpretation of false. False maps everything on false. So the object, the pullback here, when we have the subobject classifier, the pullback should be sought as those elements which go on true. I say nothing is going on true. I put zero, so everything is going on false. That's the false mapping. Uh, the equality, well, we have seen the equality. We take the diagonal and we have seen that the characteristic mapping was worst to be called the equality. So I interpret the equality between two variables like that. And if I have two terms, well, if I have two terms, those two terms give me a morphism to the product and uh, I compose with the equality. Uh, so the equality A equals B, the, the interpretation of a equals B is just this equality. And if you want to have the interpretation of tau equals sigma, well, you put the tau sigma here and you compose with that. That's your formula. The same thing holds we have seen for omega we have seen that there were morphisms like that 
to omega. We have constructed yesterday on omega the heighting algebra structure. So with those morphisms, so again, if you have, I shall write it there so that everybody can see. If I have two formulae phi and psi, uh, I take the pair phi psi, which goes as to omega times omega, and I can compose with and or imply to get the interpretation which is there of those things. What about the negation? Well, like in every logic, not phi, that's phi implies false. What do you mean by the fact that, you, that phi is false, that you do not have phi, that means that from phi you get the contradiction, you get the false. So the negation is just a special case of the implication. And then we end up with the two quantifiers. We have to interpret the quantifiers. We have essentially done that yesterday. We take the projection and we have seen that pulling back along this projection has a left adjoint and a right adjoint. Uh, sigma PB and pi pb. Very deep theorem. The construction of pi is very difficult. That of sigma is very easy. If you have uh, a morphism f, you have here pbf. This is sigma PB of F. That's just routine computation. The left adjoint to the pullback is simply composition. So that's very easy. But the construction of pi is very difficult. And we have seen yesterday that if I take a subobject S of A times B, PB, B. I can look at sigma PB of F, which is this the composite. Well, F was a monomorphism. Well, this functor is a left adjoint, so it preserves all collimates. It has no reason to preserve monomorphism. So this is maybe not a monomorphism. Take its image. Take its image. And as we have seen yesterday, in the case of sets, this image is simply the set of B such that there exists A with AB in S. This is what we have observed yesterday. Now, if I take, if I do the same thing with pi, pi PB of my F here, This time, this is at once a monomorphism one. This functor has a left adjoint, so preserves monomorphism. And as we have seen yesterday, this is the set of B such that for all A, AB is in S. This is what happens in the case of sets. Well, this gives you at once the interpretation of the formula. 
if you have a formula phi, if you have a formula phi to omega, what are the interpretation of there exist a such that phi and for all a such that phi? Well, this formula phi will induce a subobject of A times B is the characteristic mapping of some subobject. And you have here an object, and there another object, which I call uh, exists A such phi of A, and for all exists A such that phi of AB, and for all A phi of AB, these are just the two subobjects which are there. So this explains the interpretation of all the terms and all the formulae in the topos. So instead of having just a formal sequence of symbols, I have associated with each formal sequence of symbol, which is a term, I have associated a morphism, an actual morphism in the topos, and which each formal sequence of symbols, which is a formula, I have associated a morphism to omega, which in some sense intuitively tells me the truth value of phi of AB is true or is not. Well, this is what this morphism tells me intuitively. Fine. The next thing is since we have all these statements, all, all these formulae, to decide when they are true and when they are not. But before doing that, just a very small remark. Cancel all those things. What you get is what is called a coherent language with coherent terms and coherent formulae. Something is called coherent if it is built just as, as I have said, but avoiding that, avoiding that, avoiding that, avoiding that. Why should we avoid those things? because they are not respected by the inverse images of the geometric morphisms. The inverse image of a geometric morphism preserves everything which is computed using co-limits and finite limits. But this uses the exponentiation. It is not preserved by the inverse image. Uh, it is not preserved by the inverse image. It is the set of A such that phi of A. The implication is related as well to the exponentiation. It is not preserved. For all, for all, well, that the functor pi f, which is incredibly complicated. I, I did not explain how to construct it, but uh, it's incredibly complicated using the exponentiation all the time no hope to be preserved by the inverse image of a geometric morphism. For Grothendieck toposis, it is not complicated. Yeah. For toposis, yeah. it is not so complicated. No. No. Because What? you have collimates. You have collimates, yes, you have collimates. So. And, but the existence, oh, the existence, yes, that was easy. Because you just take a composition and you take the image factoriza factorization. Composition and image factorization are preserved. So our theory is coherent when you restrict your attention to what has been done here. Of course, in the case of a Grothian dictopos, you could, you could as well use infinite disjunctions since you have infinite co-limits. 
and then the theory is called geometric, as Olivia was saying yesterday. So you have false, but you don't use false. You have false, but uh, in, uh, I, I reject the use of false in writing the formulae. So uh, I, all this exists in every topos, but when I mention a coherent term or a coherent formula, is one of the terms of, of, of the formulae which I have been able to construct using only what is left on the blackboard. I avoid the other things. And then I know that the coherent term and the coherent formulae are preserved by every geometric morphism. Now, I shall say that uh, phi is true, that the formula phi holds, if and only if, well, the formula phi is something to omega, let me say uh, with one variable a, but you can take many variables, it, it doesn't matter two variables is one variable of time of type a times b eh? so i cores i look at the corresponding subobject and the corresponding the subobject classified by phi is everything i say that phi is true if it is true everywhere so when i i look at the subobject that it classifies it classifies everything intuitively Every element of A is sent on true by phi. And then you have to decide which, well, you have to work in order to see which formulae are true. In the notes, in my notes, which have been posted on the site of the conference, uh, I have written an explicit list of properties from which you can just logically infer all the properties which are valid. You write P, but it is true. I have, oh, uh, this is true. Ah, yeah. T. T, true. <laughs> yes. So, you have a lot of properties which are valid. For example, uh, you will have things like phi and psi, implies phi. You were expecting this, probably. You will have things like phi implies phi or psi. You will have, a, let me write another one, uh, that phi implies that psi implies phi and psi, and so on. You have a lot of things which are valid. In fact, all the axioms of intuitionistic logic are valid. I have given a complete list. I shall not write it down here. But be very careful. Not everything that you are used to is valid. For example, you want to prove phi. And sometimes you, you do not succeed to get a direct proof. So you say, no, but let me assume that phi is not true. Let me suppose that phi is false. Then I work a little bit and I get a contradiction. So from this, I get a contradiction. I prove false. This, I have proved this. So I have proved not, not phi. And you say, OK, if from, from the negation of phi, I get a contradiction, then phi is true. So you see, you, you are using the fact that not not phi implies phi. Well. This is not true in a topos. In general. In general. 
in general. In general, it is not true in a topos. In some toposes, it is true. We shall switch to those toposes in my last talk. Now, <laughs> you should also be very careful with something else related to the first examples which I have given there. If you can prove that phi and psi is true, then certainly phi is true and psi is true. But if you can prove this, well, classically, you see that phi is true or psi is true. This is not the case in a topos. Think of the case of a localic topos. The truth values are the elements of the local. If the intersection of two elements of the local is the top element, then both of them are the top element. If phi intersection psi equals 1, the top element, then phi and psi must be equal to 1. But if the join of phi and psi is equal to 1, there is no reason for one of them to be equal to 1, except when the local is only two elements, like in classical logic, 0 and 1. In the local 0, 1, if the join of two elements is 1, well, one of these two must be 1. Maybe both are one, but at least one of them. So this is a big difference with classical logic, yes? Um, a further class of locals where this is true are the local locales. For instance, the spectrum of a local ring. Yeah. And more generally in local toposes. Just wanted to add that remark. Mm. Okay. okay. Um, so in general, it's totally correct that this does not follow. But there is a class of toposes in which it does follow, namely the so-called local toposes. Yeah. And examples for local toposes are sheaf toposes over local locales. And an example for that is the spectrum, as an algebraic geometry, of a local ring. Now you can switch further to the case of the quantifiers and again uh, various things old about quantifiers and again in the notes I have written a full list of the properties that you need in order to infer all the other properties. For example, it is true that if you have that for all x, phi implies psi, then for all x, phi implies that for all x, psi. It is also true, for example, that if for all x, phi implies psi, then if there exists an x such that phi, there exists an x such that psi, and things like that. So there are a lot of things which hold. But let me arrive at the last step. How can we use this internal logic in order to prove results in a topos. Well,
Let me, for example, take two arrows, F and G, from A to B. F equals G if and only if the following formula is true. F is a monomorphism if and only if the following formula is true. F is an epimorphism if and only if the following formula is true. Uh, sorry. Exists A such that B is equal to F of A. Every time you take, of course, A is always of type A, B of type B. So you write down the classical description and you can, uh, in the same way, uh, write down the everything which has to do with the intersection, with the union, with, with all those things. So all the structure in a topos, you can describe it in that way. I don't need to put for all. If, if I have this formula, you can put for all A there exists, yes. For, for, for all B there exists an A if you prefer to put a... On the first line. No, on the first line, no. No. When A is a variable, I take a variable like that, I prove that F of A is equal to G of A for an arbitrary variable these variables somehow intuitively represent whatever element of A, even if A doesn't have elements. And so you can, well, for example, <coughs> you could write the equalizer of F and G, while the equalizer of F and G is a subobject, well, it is the one which is written the set of A, such that uh, f of a equals g of a. We have seen that this, which f of a equals g of a is a formula. The set of variables such that a formula is a subobject. Uh, so we can develop all the, <coughs> we can describe the structure of a topos now using its internal logic. So, and then, and then we can write down proofs with the internal logic. Let us take an example. Uh, Laurent has mentioned the theory of groups and recalled you what a group is in a topos, so the group is, has an addition, has the opposite, and has a, a zero morphism, with all the axioms that you need, that's a group in a topos. Then, uh, if you have two groups, well, you have a group homomorphism between two groups, well, it's a mapping, it's a morphism of the topos, which commutes with those operations. Among all the morphisms, you have one which is very special, which is the zero morphism. So you take the unique mapping to the terminal object, you follow by the zero mapping, and you call this the zero morphism between the two groups. All right? In the category of groups, it is well known that various lemmas are valid. So if you take an exact sequence of groups, exact sequence means this is the kernel of the second morphism, the second morphism is the co-kernel of the first. Kernel means the equalizer, this one is the equalizer of that one with zero, that one is the co-equalizer of the first one and zero. Kernel and co-kernel is always equalizer of and co-equalizer with zero. 
So that's an exact sequence of groups. You have another exact sequence of groups here. You have a morphism of exact sequences. So, vertical arrows which make the diagram commutative. And the five lemma tells you that if those two things are isomorphisms, the central one is an isomorphism as well. This is true in every topos, locally, Houghton, Dick, elementary, whatever. Well, that's not very difficult to prove, but okay, nevertheless, a little bit tricky. Hmm? But here is a proof. Let me show you a very rigorous proof of that in a topos. We want to prove that this is an isomorphism. This means that it is both monomorphism and epimorphism. Let me prove first it is a monomorphism. To prove that it is a monomorphism, I have to take two elements here, A and B, which are mapped on the same element C, and I must prove that they are equal. The element C goes on an element D by the image. I am using my construction. I have a morphism, I have a term here, I get a term over there. B is going to E. This one is going to F. Then those two A goes on D. The square is commutative, so E goes on D. F goes on D. Okay. But I have here two terms of type C, which is a group. I can apply the operation and get the term E minus F. This is a group homomorphism. E minus F goes on the image of E, which is D, minus the image of F, which is D. This is zero. Oh, but this is a monomorphism. So it sends this on zero. It sends zero on zero. So this is zero. So E minus F is zero. So this means that E minus B, which is mapped on E minus F, is in A because A is a set of the, of the elements which are mapped on zero. So A minus B is here. A minus B is there, fine. So A minus B goes on an element uh, H, which goes here on an element I. Which element? Oh. I, A minus B, goes, goes on what? Uh, on C minus C. That is on zero. So my element by commutativity, A minus B goes on C minus C goes on zero. So H goes on zero. Ah, but this is a monomorphism. So A, both H and zero go on zero, so H is zero. Ah, oh, yes, but this is a monomorphism. So H is zero, so A minus B is zero. So A equals B. And I have proved it is a monomorphism. And I can do exactly the same thing with epimorphism. Uh, probably it's worth doing it uh, last time. So you see what I have done is just to write down the proof somehow in the category of sets, but using exactly all the rules of my uh, internal logic. And so I know that things hold, that, that this is an actual proof. I want to prove this is an epi, so I have to take an element here, 
and I must find an element which is sent on it. Okay, the A will go on B. But this is an isomorphism, so the B by the inverse of the isomorphism goes on C. This is an epimorphism. So the C comes from an element D. And the element D goes on an element E by commutativity, E goes on B. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have no reason for D to be applied on A up to now. Okay, but, but, A minus E is applied on B minus B is applied on zero. So A minus E is living in the kernel. Oh, since it is living in the kernel by the inverse isomorphism, it comes from some F. F goes on some G, which by commutativity goes on A minus E. Then I take G plus D. It will go on A minus A plus A. That's A. So I have found something which goes on A. And I have proved the five lemma in every topos. You see that the idea of this technique you can work as if you were in the category of sets, but be very careful, not all the logical rules are valid. Some rules are not valid. Be very careful as soon as you are using or or a negation. Be very careful with that. They do not behave like in the case of sets. But what I have done here is a correct proof in every topos of the five lemma for non-commutative groups. Okay, let us stop some minutes. Um, there is a small mystery hidden there. Yeah. Because the second statement about the epimorphism is in fact the formal dual of the first statement about the monomorphism. Yeah. So it suffices to prove one of those, and the other one is then by duality. Okay. In, uh, you can express this in arbitrary abelian categories, and the dual. I was working precisely to avoid that with non-commutative groups. Ah, okay, okay, but but for abelian. Uh, in the abelian case, of course, you. In yeah. the abelian case, of course, yeah. that's a dual statement. Okay, but then there's a mystery, because the two element elementary proofs. Yeah. do not look at all the same. They look very different. Yeah, they do. Even though the statements are just duals of each other. Yeah, the statements are dual. Yeah. So sometime when I grow up, I'd like to understand this better. Yeah. Just what yeah. So we stop six minutes and a half, eh? like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs>